Good afternoon. I'm Jeff Balzer, Associate Vice Chancellor for Research, and today it's my uh, great pleasure to welcome you to our first Vanderbilt Discovery Lecture of the fall semester. Last year we were treated to some of the great minds in science and medicine from outside Vanderbilt and from within our own walls. That's why we created the Discovery Lecture Series to bring the world's most influential scholars to our campus to share their vision and their creativity while also making sure the entire research enterprise here is hearing the most innovative work from our own superstars. We shouldn't have to go to a national meeting to hear about the most exciting science coming out of our own laboratories. Today's speaker is one such superstar, Dr. Frank Harrell, who is professor and chair of Vanderbilt's Department of Biostatistics. I'll try not to knock over his water. Um, he earned his PhD in biostatistics at Chapel Hill and has served on the faculties at Duke and the University of Virginia. Frank is both a thought leader in biostatistics and a driver of how biostatistical practice is developing in academic medicine. Among many leadership activities, he's a member of the NIH Biostatistical Methods and Research Design Study Section. Um, and he's also associate editor of the journal Statistics in Medicine. Frank, in fact, is author of the most cited article in the 25-year history of that journal by nearly a two-to-one margin. Um, he, asked, he, he mentioned to me that he, in, he likes having that article cited, but he really dislikes it when people cite it and do the opposite of what he asked them to do in the article. So, so if you're going to cite the article, please do the right thing. In 2003, Vanderbilt had the great fortune to recruit Frank as the founding chair of our Department of Biostatistics, and the story around how all that happened is very exciting and interesting and um, is evidence that Vanderbilt knows how to move quickly on its feet when it decides what to do, so sometime ask Dean Gabby to tell you that story about how that got done. Under Frank's expert leadership, the department is not only exploring and advancing research in the field of biostatistics, but it's providing information is dispersed, messages used for decision making. Uh, information is the result of processing data and organize, organizing it in a way that adds to the knowledge of the retrieval of the information. The value of information is judged by the variety of outcomes to which the information leads. And optimum decision making must use the most complete set of information and the most current set of information that the decision maker is capable of handling. These are examples of some of the important decisions that, that need to be made in biomedical research and in clinical practice. Pathways in biology, mechanisms of action of drugs, what's the best way to use gene and protein expression data to diagnose patients or to treat diseases. Um, what biomarkers are the best 
for diagnosis or developing a prognosis and what's the best way to utilize those biomarkers? What's the best way to diagnose this disease in general or, be, or to form a prognosis after the diagnosis is made? Is a risk factor causative or is it just a reflection of some other variable, confounding, confounding variable? How should we measure patient outcome? Is a drug effective for an outcome and which patients should get a drug if not all? So inflammation allergy is defined as the failure to obtain key information needed to make a sound decision. It's also defined as ignoring available information and in biomedical research, this is by far the most prevalent form of inflammation allergy. These are examples and I'll be going through these examples, these types of examples one by one in this talk. So one example is touting a new biomarker, some sexy new discovery and saying that it may uh, diagnose colon cancer or make a good prognostic estimate for patients when that biomarker may actually have less information than data that's already available and is almost uh, free. Ignoring confounders or alternate explanations is, is another way of ignoring information. Ignoring subject heterogeneity, um, and I'll be given an example of how that has a big impact on how we interpret clinical trials. Categorizing continuous variables or categorizing subject responses is a wonderful way to discard information, and that information is very important. Categorizing predictions as right or wrong is another way to discard information and to insert a degree of arbitrariness into uh, a line of research. And then letting the fear of probabilities and cost or utilities uh, uh, make an author of a research article form uh, diagnostic or prognostic decisions uh, declaring patients dead or alive, declaring patients diseased or not diseased, uh, making decisions for individual patients in a research ar article instead of the bedside is a major way in which information is, is misused and underused. This is an example of ignoring variables, and I'll be giving s uh, some other examples of ignoring variables. This is a situation where uh, patients have an acute myocardial infarction or heart attack, and we're interested in developing a prognosis for the patient. One of the measures that's commonly used for measuring the accuracy of a forecasting method or a predictive method is what's called the concordance probability or C index or area under a receiver operating characteristic curve. So it's a measure of the ability to discriminate patients with a bad outcome from patients with a good outcome. In this case, dead or alive within 30 days after the heart attack. Uh, an older marker that's used to diagnose and to prognosticate an acute myocardial infarction is CKMB, which has this accuracy index in this study of 0.63. A newer marker was touted as being more predictive, and that's troponin T, which is a measure of uh, muscle death. Uh, it has an index of 0.69. So if you dichotomize troponin T the way most people do, at say 0.1, uh, the, uh, the information decreases to 0.64. Now, 0.5 is the point of randomness. So if you have a, a C index of 0.5, that means you, you have no information about the outcome. A 1.0 means perfect prediction. Um, CKMB, when added to troponin T, gives a 0.69. So troponin T is really has more information uh, than CKMB. Uh, if you just take the age and the sex of the patient, you have an accuracy of 0.8, which far exceeds the value of troponin T. And in the article, and I was a co-author on this article in 96, uh, we sort of pushed the separate value of troponin T in, in isolation, which I think, uh, I think we were a bit misleading about that. This is another way in which information is ignored that needs to be taken into account. Nutritional epidemiology is a really big field of research. Findings are coming out all the time. The public generally doesn't know what to believe. Is a food good for you or bad for you? And one of the reasons is the kind of research uh, that's done traditionally in nutritional epidemiology uh, has leaves a lot to be desired. So this is a very important paper by Sander Greenland in 2000 in which he studied a pretty typical case control study 
in nutritional epidemiology, in this case cancer epidemiology, looking at uh, women with breast cancer versus controls. There were 140 breast cancer cases, 222 controls, 35 different food constituents were studied, and five confounder variables. These food intakes are correlated with each other. Uh, if you eat a lot of one substance, in some ways you must eat less of another substance. So these are, these are sort of competing factors. And what Greenland has shown is that it's impossible to get the right answer about food intakes and, uh, and relationship with disease and, and outcomes without looking simultaneously at, at the different intakes. So the traditional analysis found out of these 35 foods that 11 foods were significantly correlated with breast cancer at the 0.05 level. If you do a, a for fairly naive analysis where you adjust simultaneously for 35 foods at one time, you'll come up with only two significant foods that seem to be correlated with breast cancer, and that's without adjusting for multiple comparisons. But if you do a very rigorous analysis, and his paper goes through this in, in a, a wonderful example, what the conclusion was is there's no foods associated with breast cancer, and that's pretty much what Greenland believes is the right answer. And I think the analysis that he does is one that is very uncommonly used in this line of research and needs to be used much more. So he was using all of the available information simultaneously, including simultaneous food intakes of all 35 constituents. Another way to ignore a good information is in randomized experiments, randomized clinical trials. Now randomization, as we know, tends to balance all measured and unmeasured factors. That's why we randomize patients to different treatment groups to try to isolate the effect from all the other effects on patients. But subjects vary widely within a treatment group. They may have, they may be 20 years old, they might be 90 years old. There's males and females, they're low and high blood pressure. There's tremendous variation. Um, and this heterogeneity is usually ignored in the way clinical trials are presented and analyzed. And it's ignored in the false belief that the randomization makes this variation irrelevant. The alternative to take into account the patient variability is analysis of covariance. So here's an example from a very large clinical trial. Again, it's acute heart attack. The GUSTO-1 study, the main hypothesis was whether accelerated dosing of tissue plasminogen activator uh, reduces mortality after heart attack when compared to a standard clot-busting drug of streptokinase. The endpoint was 30-day mortality. The overall mortality was 7%. In this trial, 10,000 patients were given accelerated TPA, 20,000 patients given streptokinase. This is a sample of some of the baseline characteristics of patients in the study. And we can see, as you would expect in any big randomized trial where the randomization was done faithfully, you see tremendous balance in the two treatment arms, almost exactly the same mean age, almost exactly the same mean weight, height, percentage females, percentage smoking. Everything is going to be almost exactly the same. And that agreement across the treatment arms has nothing whatsoever to do with whether you should adjust for the patient's age. The GUSTO-1 study was a remarkable study in many ways, one of which it has no, had no age restriction in the randomization. So there was, I think, a 22-year-old and there was, a, I think, a 103-year-old patient randomized. So age had a tremendous distribution as well as the other variables. The overall reduction of mortality for TPA was 0.01, which translates to a relative reduction of 15% and the odds of death at 30 days. If you adjust for patient heterogeneity, this reduction moves from 15% to 18% reduction, which doesn't sound like a very large difference, except uh, when you consider the fact that if you did an adjusted analysis that takes into account that patients are different from each other, you could do the same, get the same power of the treatment test with 19% fewer patients, which would be saving 5,700 patients from having to be exposed to the experimental and control arms. Uh, so that's a pretty major gain. And in some other randomized trials, you get even larger gains than that. So in addition to getting a, an increase in the power and precision of the study, the covariates are also useful for risk modeling. 
and estimating an absolute reduction. Now, this is what a risk model looks like when you draw it as a diagram that's called a nomogram. Most of you are familiar with nomograms like the one that converts height and weight to, to body surface area or height and weight to um, body mass index, and there's a whole lot of blood gas nomograms and so on. Um, this just translates the different factors to points so that you can manage them and you can get estimates by, by uh, hand. Kilop class is a measure of how much shock the patient is in after a heart attack. There's an interaction between age and Kilop class. So you have to look at the age scale according to the class here. And uh, let's say we have a 50-year-old who's in class four, that patient will get about 65 risk points. And then if that person has a systolic blood pressure rate of only 40, they'll get about 33 more risk points. Heart rate will give you so many points. Whether or not you, you had a previous heart attack and then the location of the heart attack will give you points. You add those points up and you read down here a, a excellent estimate of the probability that that patient will die um, within 30 days after treatment if it's the control treatment. And then it's a very easy matter to go ahead and convert that to the absolute risk reduction due to the more expensive treatment. Now, this is a $2,000 per dose treatment, at least it was when this study was conducted. Streptokinase was about $200 a dose. So this is what a risk model looks like. Uh, it's, it's much more fun to look at this than all the algebra that goes behind that. And you can use this calculation to estimate the distribution of risk reduction. And this is what that di distribution looks like here. This is the absolute risk reduction for individual patients in the trial estimated by that model. Uh, and this is the distribution of the baseline expected risk. Now, someone who is over here, and there's a large number of low-risk patients, uh, that is going to be persons that don't have shock, they're younger, they have smaller heart attacks. Uh, this is going to be patients who are in shock, who might be 100 years old, uh, and so on. So the, the best reduction you could possibly get in the study is an absolute reduction of 5% in the probability of death. Um, and the mean uh, reduction is what was quoted as the overall study result, as we usually quote, the difference in two proportions. But that mean is dominated by a good number of patients, uh, actually a not a good number of patients, who have a high risk reduction. These are the patients with large heart attacks, older, in shock, and so on. These patients dominate the calculation of the mean of 1% reduction. But the median reduction is about 0.7%. And there's a good many patients that have only um, a 0.2% reduction, which would be right in here. This is a 0.2% reduction in absolute mortality. So you can do cost-effectiveness analysis. You can decide should drugs be approved or not approved, or you can look at all of the data and decide exactly which patients uh, should the drugs be used on. I think uh, you should know, too, that this sort of distribution of varying treatment effects, where a patient who starts out with a zero risk cannot go any lower. He can't go negative on the risk scale. So you have this wide variety of effects this sort of variety often is larger than the variety seen in pharmacogenomics and personalized medicine using very expensive data. And this is using trivial, simple, cheap data. Categorizing continuous variables is one of the great evils of analyzing data, and it's a battle that we fight in our department every day. Uh, for some reason, physicians are afraid of continuous variables. They think they don't, need, they don't know how to handle them. And I, don't, I still don't know the source of that fear. Uh, but they attempt to find cut points so they can think of things as high or low. Mathematically, such a cut point cannot even exist unless, unless the relationship with the marker and the outcome is discontinuous like this. And we don't see many discontinuous relationships in medicine. Even if the cut point existed, it would not be possible for the cut point to be constant. So if you're using, say, a cut point of 0.1 on troponin T, that's an invalid cut point for um, an older patient. You would need to use different cut points for depending on the, the risk factors of the patient. 
So this is an example from uh, research done by WHO um, in developing countries. This was five clinics in five different developing countries. And we, for this purpose, I simplified the data down to just a couple of factors, which is does the sick infant present to a clinic um, with a cough or not, and what's the respiratory rate? So this is not a complete picture of how to often diagnose pneumonia in infants. Uh, pneumonia was diagnosed by having chest x-rays in, in all of the infants in this study. You can see that the cough has a, a pretty, presence of cough has a pretty big impact on the probability that chest x-ray will demonstrate pneumonia. And the respiratory rate has a pretty big impact, especially as you cross 50. Um, now, if you wanted to impose a cutoff, as so many physicians seem to want to do, the cutoff you impose on the respiratory rate, if the patient had no cough, might be out here, but you would have to have a different cutoff if the patient had a cough. It would have to be a lower cutoff. So there's no such thing as having a single cutoff for a very, the attempt to find cutoffs is really a futile uh, exercise. So optimum decision making is going to come when you look at this probability. And how you get there can be from different things. But that dictates the cutoffs have to vary. So cut points are really disasters. And we have so many examples from the literature of this now, it's surprising that everyone, not everyone, but so many researchers at Vanderbilt are still using them. Uh, there are great examples in the breast cancer prognosis literature. Uh, S phase fraction is one marker that was supposed to be your prognostic value in breast cancer. Um, the literature examined, or many papers examined S phase fraction. The different papers in the literature came up with 19 different cut points for this one variable. And another marker, cathepsin D content, there were 12 studies. They each sought a cut point. They each found a different cut point that disagreed with all of the other 11 cut points. And so the American Society of Clinical Oncology, partially as a result of this, said, let's not use either of these. It's just too messy. They're not reliable. But the real problem is the cut points did not exist. So when you have a smooth relationship and you try to find a cut point when it doesn't look like this, you're not going to find anything that means anything. Uh, another problem with cut points is they can really lead people to data dredging um, and false discoveries. So there was a nice paper by Wainer that showed for any data set where there's no relationship to outcome, by dredging the data, you can find cut points that will give you an increasing relationship with the outcome. You go look again, and he actually published the algorithm for finding these cut points. You go and look again with different cut points, you'll find a decreasing relationship with outcome from the same data. And the data set looked like this. Cut points also remove the meaning of variables, and this is a very subtle point. Um, researchers tend to want to compare high with low, and they don't realize that high is not something you can actually define, and I'll explain why, and the same for low. So if you wanted to say, what's the relationship between body mass index and the incidence of asthma? Uh, there's an attempt by many researchers to find a cut point for body mass index and to get a ratio of the incidence of, as of asthma for high versus low. This results in very inaccurate predictions, residual confounding, makes the results actually impossible to interpret because high has an unknown mixture of people and low has an unknown mixture of people. And these mixtures vary with the population. This is the best single paper in the literature for demonstrating the evils of dichotomizing continuous variables. Uh, this is an example of using serum bilirubin to predict mortality. This is the hazard ratio. They analyzed the data and said if you had to find an optimum cut point, it would be a bilirubin of 45, which is right here. So they're actually assuming a discontinuous relationship. Now, if you were to transport this to another population, that other population, even among those who are less than 45, may have a different distribution of lows. And those among, above 45 may have a different distribution of highs. And if you have a different distribution of highs, so you have more above 70, more above 200, when you calculate a risk ratio, you'll find the risk ratio is disagreeing 
with this ratio here because this mixture cannot be held constant. So this is a quantity that you cannot define. Furthermore, it's a poor predictor. So if you use a straight line, that's not a very accurate model in this case, but it's still going to be overall more accurate than using a discontinuous relationship. We have a lot of modern approaches now for estimating relationships such as spline functions, and this is two of these modern approaches. They sort of agree with each other. And the dichotomized estimate agrees with the good estimates only at two different points. So think about a decision support system that might have a trigger. What do you do when the bilirubin exceeds 45? It might lead to a totally different decision for 46 than for a 44. And that difference might be due to measurement error. So it's, it's not a good idea to have a decision that's triggered on a fine difference. It's a very arbitrary decision. This is an example of how uh, throwing away information can lead to silliness in a randomized clinical trial. There have been many trials that have come up with endpoints that are just plain silly, and this is a good example. This was actually used in a blood pressure study. Stephen Sen wrote about this. Um, the blood pressure study called for a designation of a successful treatment being Either the patient has gone down from a baseline diastolic blood pressure that was above 95 to be below 90, or has achieved a 10% achieved reduction in blood pressure from baseline. Sin uh, derived what is the relationship between the baseline diastolic blood pressure and the probability of a response. And you see that the patients who have the great fortune to be responders in this discontinuous relationship are, the, are those that are just above 95 they have a much higher chance of responding. So this is a very strange way to state an endpoint, um, and it's very low precision, low power, rather than just using diastolic blood pressure. Classification is, a, is another problem that is uh, related to what we've already been talking. Um, a lot of uh, researchers and a lot of studies um, try to classify patients as diseased or normal, an arbitrary decision. If you have a reliable estimate of the probability of disease and you know the consequences of a false positive or false negative or consequences of various decisions, you can make an optimum decision. That optimum decision depends on that one patient's probability of disease. It doesn't depend on anything whatsoever about what the probability of diseases are for the other patients in your study. It depends only on the characteristics of the patient at hand. So the consequences of making a decision are known really only at the point of care. And so many articles assume that they know the consequences of a decision and they will derive a, a classification system and call patients dead or alive, diseased or non-diseased. But categorization can only be done at the point of care. It cannot be done by an author of an article. Continuous probabilities have many advantages, and one of those is that they, are, they have their own self-contained error rates. So if you have a patient that has a very low probability of disease and you decide to treat the patient as if the patient's normal, you'll know by definition the probability that you're making a mistake is 0.03 patient that has a probability of 0.4 and you treat the patient as if he's normal, by definition you have a probability of doing the wrong thing of 0.4. A 0.75 who's treated as if diseased, by definition you have a 0.25 chance of making the wrong decision. So these probabilities tend to be discarded very early in diagnostic research and in the practice of diagnosis and I think we need to do a lot better job educating physicians about the value of probabilistic diagnosis. Predictions, when classified as good or bad, this leads to a lot of problems in research. This has been rampant problem in gene microarray studies. Um, and the problem is using an improper rule for classifying the success of a predictive method. So when you're doing feature extraction, like what genes are important, um, what are the prognostic factors that should be in a model, you have to have a scoring rule 
to drive the derivation of the features, the feature subset and the predictions. That scoring rule, which some people call an accuracy score, can be something like a correlation coefficient, an ROC area, or what's almost always used in, in uh, genomics seems to be the proportion of classified, uh, proportion of, of uh, predictions that are classified as correct. Now this is something that Constantine Eliferis has studied extensively and has written a, a paper that really elucidates the problem in gene microarray research because of an article that came out in The Lancet a couple of years ago. Well, who was the first author of that article? Mitchell? Uh, stated that there was no signal in hardly any microarray findings ever published. And in a sense, Mitchell was right, but what Constantine showed is that, that it was true because almost all published microarray results used the percent classified correct as their scoring rule for the measuring the success of the predictions, and that just makes for noisy predictions. So that's a discontinuous rule, it's an improper rule. Improper scoring rule is one that is maximized by a bogus model, and I'll show you what that means in a minute. In addition to giving you the wrong model and introducing a lot of noise into the research process, um, this is a way to use minimum information. So if you ever decided that you had in your 20 patient microarray study, you didn't like to have all that information, but you really only, only wanted to use the information in 13 of those patients, then arbitrarily classifying patients as colon cancer or no colon cancer is a great way to effectively throw out seven of those 20 patients' data. Um, so this will reduce your power. It adds a lot of arbitrariness to the analysis. And it takes the analyst to be the provider of the utility function and not the person who is applying the prediction. Sensitivity and specificity are likewise um, improper scoring rules. So any analysis that attempts to maximize sensitivity and specificity will result in an improper model. Here's an example from a simulated data set with 400 patients of whom 57% had disease, and I decided to arbitrarily classify patients to have disease if their predicted probability exceeds 0.5, which is commonly done. Uh, first of all, what happens if we just predict every patient to have the same result? Let's predict every patient to have disease without even looking at the data. By definition, we'll have 57% correct without looking at the patient's data because of this prevalence that we have in our sample. So that would be a chi-square of zero, so that's a model that predicts the same value for every patient. That's an ROC area of 0.5, which means it's no good. It's no information in that prediction. If you were to use age by itself in this sample, you can get a 0.59 here. You get a highly statistically significant association of age and disease, and the proportion classified correct is 62%. Sex by itself is less valuable um, than age on this measure and on this measure, but it's actually more valuable by this measure. Uh, and this is the more sensitive measure. Age and sex together gives you uh, the best value here and the, and the best value, actually not, and it gives you not the best value here. So what happened? We add a variable to the model that is hugely statistically significant. We are going from 10.5 to 22.8. That's a p-value of 0 0.0005. So it would be hard to argue that knowing the sex of the patient takes away from your ability to diagnose or prognosticate. But the proportion classified correctly says exactly that. It says that the sex variable not only has no information, it has harmful information, information you would pay money not to know. And that's really the wrong answer. By every other measure, especially ones that are continuous and very sensitive and don't require cut points, the sex variable is highly useful. Continuous markers are very valuable and we just need to learn better how to use them. They avoid cut points. They give you a better risk spectrum. They provide a gray zone. So if you get a marker back and it's somewhere in the middle, and you really don't know uh, what to do, the probability of the disease is 
Well, it tells you now you've justified spending a few hundred bucks and ordering another test instead of just arbitrarily classifying someone as normal or, or abnormal. And you get more power and precision. So this is an example from a very commonly used marker, the prostate-specific antigen. Um, and this is a data set of, I forgot how many men were in the data set. These are men who have had prostatectomy, and we look two years follow-up to see who has disease recurrence. Um, we have a very smooth relationship that can be accurately modeled, and this is 95% confidence interval for that relationship. This shows you the distribution of PSA. And so we're giving predicted risks that go from here all the way up to here. The staging system, the newest one that's been proposed, gives three different prognoses at these values, and most of the patients are placed in stage one. So it gives you some spectrum of prognosis, which means it's useful. But the question is, is it arbitrary? And is the staging system as useful as it might be? This is a comparison of various staging systems in prostate cancer and use of PSA and Gleason score without dichotomization or cut points. This is an old four, uh, this is actually a five uh, stage system. There's one out here. Uh, one or two patients out here. These bars are like histograms, so most of the patients were placed in stage one. And you can see when you're looking at PSA, this was your distribution of uh, estimates on the basis of PSA. A lot of the men had fairly normal PSAs over here. Now this is tracking one patient all the way. How is that patient pr uh, predicted differently? You look at different systems for prognosis. So this patient is getting a, a moderately high risk of recurrence here, uh, a lower risk by just on the basis of the Gleason score for the removed tumor. And on the basis of PSA and Gleason and a combination, is getting a much higher predicted probability of disease recurrence. So you're seeing that these predictions are not agreeing with each other. These are using far more information. You see much wider risk spectrum with using the continuous variables, you see better ROC areas or C indexes. This is using PSA, Gleason, and, and an old staging system for prostate cancer, and it actually gives you the best stratification of risk, the widest stratification, and it's able to put some men at nearly a zero risk, which these crude staging systems are not able to do. And I think it would be very comforting for a man to be told that his risk is way down here, much farther to closer to zero than this. So these, these staging systems here included PSA and Gleason score in the staging system. But they used them very ineffectively by using only cut points and not using the continuous variables. I'm going to make a, a sort of change in course now for a few minutes. I, I've been talking about numeric information. Another kind of information we know that's very useful is visual information. Uh, and I'm going to give you just a wonderful example of visual information. But before that, I have to give you a terrible example of visual information. This is a kind of graphic display that is rampantly used in basic science. We affectionately call it a dynamite plot <laughs> in, our, in our department. Um, and a dynamite plot is a way to cover up your data. It's, it's a display that's, that's said to have a maximum ink to information ratio. <laughs> and it's also a display that causes an optical illusion because it's been shown in studies of perception that the reader adds some of this height here to the height of the main area when they're interpreting the graph. They do this subconsciously. It also covers up the lower confidence limit here. There's no reason not to show the data, uh, and unless you think there's too much variability and you want to hide it. But we see many cases in animal experimentation where there was a little more variability than the investigator maybe wanted to be known public, but I think it's only fair to actually show the variability in the paper. You can show, in addition to the raw data, you can show the mean, median, quartiles, you know, all sorts of other goodies. Uh, the next example I'm going to go through is, um, is a real example of, rev of, of a revelation applied, uh, supplied by a visual. 
uh, along the lines of what Galileo uh, brings to the world when he first saw a telescope in 1611. And in 1616, he had a better telescope and he could um, draw this coin at the bottom. So Galileo said that um, um, all the disputes that so, for so many generations have vexed philosophers are destroyed by visual certainty and we are liberated from wordy arguments. So an excellent graphic can do that and a graphic can also have a bigger impact than numbers. So one of the best examples I've seen of that kind of impact was a very accurate drawing made uh, by uh, Hawksworth uh, who was there when a slave ship was captured off the coast of Africa and this ship was captured in um, 1822, in April of 1822, the Vigilante. So this was a slave ship that was containing a lot of slaves and we can, um, I think, zoom in. better this accurate depiction of how these slaves were held in the ship. And you can also see, if you look closely, the kind of shackles that were used, different sorts of shackles were used uh, to keep the slaves in place. It's also interesting perspective to look at the size of the captain's cabin here in relationship to the amount of space given to each captive also the size of the wine stores and other things. This is a, uh, another um, drawing etching from Hawksworth uh, showing that the captured slaves were actually held uh, vertically and horizontally. This ship held 227 men and 120 women and the drawings were um, part of a very powerful anti-slavery publication that was published by the Religious Society of Friends in London in 1823. Of course, this ship was only one of many, many ships that ended up kidnapping over 12 million individuals and bringing them to the so-called New World. I want to turn now to uh, the final part of the talk, which is a case study of the consequences of ignoring information. I'm glad Dan Roden is here because he can correct any errors I make about this. Um, this is a case study uh, in which uh, ignoring information can kill. And this case study is cardiac and anti arrhythmic drugs. Um, back in the uh, early 70s, uh, when patients were monitored uh, after they had a heart attack, and I see Bud is over here too, can help keep me honest. Um, Patients had a heart attack and were monitored. It wasn't uncommon to observe on the monitors these premature ventricular contractions that you see in this drawing below. And after a while, anecdotal evidence came in that uh, patients who had an increased frequency of premature ventricular contractions tended to have a higher rate of sudden cardiac death. So not long after those anecdotal observations, uh, more data was obtained, such as the data you see here. This divides the PVC frequency into intervals, and within each interval, such as zero premature beats per hour, um, between zero and one, one to 10, we see an increasing uh, one-year cardiac mortality rate. So this kind of data led to uh, what's called the arrhythmia suppression hypothesis, and this was championed by cardiologist Bernard Lown and was widely accepted by 1978. And Lown said that any prophylactic program against sudden death must involve the use of antiarrhythmic drugs to subdue ventricular premature complexes. So there's often a tendency in medicine, when you see something bad, you want to do something about it. But there's a step that was missing here. Now, there were some analyses done that should have identified the problem. Um, and this paper, another paper I'm going to reference did, did talk about some of this. Uh, but the statisticians that were involved in this particular research, uh, some of which was spearheaded at uh, Rochester, University of Rochester, uh, 
they really believed in categorizing continuous variables. And I'm not sure why they did that, but they loved categorical data analysis. And I had a huge argument with them back around 1980, and uh, we actually almost got kicked out of a restaurant because of uh, raising our voices about it. <laughs> um, but they loved categorization. So these, these statisticians in charge of this analysis, and they developed a model for uh, prognosis after acute uh, MI. And they dichotomized the most important variable you could measure, which is a great measure of the pumping efficiency of the uh, left ventricle, which is the, uh, called the ejection fraction. They dichotomized that at 0.4. They also dichotomized the premature ventricular contractions at 10 per hour. And then they had an indicator of lung rouse and also an indicator of whether the patient was in class two, three, or four New York Heart Association uh, class for uh, heart failure, I believe. So they came up with this model, and then they further simplified by just counting how many risk factors are present. And there's a very funny phenomenon that happens in this graph, if you'll just remember this line here at 12 months. Zero factors present, the prognosis was about a 2% chance of cardiac mortality at one year. And then this goes up to about 47% probability of cardiac death at one year. So keep in mind that 2 to 47. The, in the same article, the researchers had this very valuable graph, which is the left ventricular ejection fraction, uh, not as a smooth function, but they cut it at, in several intervals. And it's an interesting thing that happens. When you look at this graph, the prognosis goes from about 2% to about 47%. So this one variable has about the same prognostic information as the entire model that they used. But even more importantly for this purpose, the approach that they used led them to have what's called uh, residual confounding. There were results that would have been explained by looking at this kind of variation in ejection fraction, whereas they counted someone with an ejection fraction of 15 identical to someone who had an ejection fraction of 39. And that's where all your prognostic stratification really is. So they count these patients as homogeneous. And they did not adjust for ejection fraction. They only adjusted for whether ejection fraction was less than 0.4. So another way of saying that is if you looked at the frequency of PVCs when the EF is 0.3 and, and, and to 0.4, that's going to be lower than the frequency of premature contractions when the ejection fraction is, say, between 0.2 uh, and point 0.1. So arrhythmia has turned out to be prognostic in isolation, but not after adjusting for continuous ejection fraction, especially not after adjusting for anatomic variables. And uh, this paper here showed that arrhythmias are really predicted by uh, a local uh, wall motion abnormality as well as global left ventricular function. Those are the key predictors of ventricular arrhythmia. So what happened next? Well, instead of showing that arrhythmias were something that you should modify, and one of the first prerequisites for, for attempting to modify something is that it should be an independent risk factor, uh, drug development was launched, and a very long dr drug development program uh, for class one antiarrhythmic drugs was undertaken. And there was a famous study done, the coronary card cardiac arrhythmia suppression trial, or CAST, which randomized patients to these groups. And this was studying class 1C antiarrhythmic drugs, especially flecainide and enconide. The cardiologist designing the study said that it was unethical to include a placebo group. It would be unethical to expose patients to placebo when they had PVCs. There was a, uh, some, a leading biostatistician who argued very uh, forcefully, I think it was Dave Demetz, I'm not sure, argued forcefully that a placebo group should really be there because it, it, you should at least know if these drugs actually help people. So the study was designed, thankfully, with a placebo group, uh, but the study was designed with one tail test so that it did not entertain the possibility that the drugs would hurt people. Um, but the Safety and Data Monitoring Board stopped the study early in 1989, recommending early termination, at least of these two arms, because what they saw was 56 deaths in the drug group if you combine these two drugs 
22 deaths in the placebo group, which is a relative risk of two and a half. So the class one antiarrhythmics seem to increase your mortality by a factor of two and a half. And of course, you were wanting that to be a decrease in mortality. So this was written about at length in a book called Deadly Medicine written by Thomas Moore. Uh, he goes into the details of the drug development program. He goes into potential conflicts of interest of some of the people overviewing this for FDA. Uh, he goes into the preclinical work, which some of that was, was indicating harm. Some of that preclinical work was ignored. I think there was either some, even some work in large animals such as uh, apes, the great apes, that showed uh, potential great harm. But all of that was swept under the rug because of the great belief uh, in these drugs. So um, the estimate is somewhere between 24,000 and 69,000 people were killed because of these class 1C antiarrhythmics, which is about the same that's estimated uh, as due to Vioxx. Of course, Vioxx was killing people uh, from heart problems when it's trying to treat pain. Uh, these antiarrhythmics antiarrhythmics were, were causing arrhythmic deaths when they were trying to prevent arrhythmic deaths. Uh, so the ventricular arrhythmia suppression hypothesis was refuted. PVCs were merely an indicator of underlying permanent damage. Um, and the proper analyses that would show that were not done before this drug development was launched. So I'd like to close with a couple of quick things uh, about the dangers of information. Information is not without its problems because sometimes information can come at a very high price. This is one example from history of very, very costly information. And information can also be very, very dangerous. So I want to thank you for your attention and thank you for having me. Yeah, that's a great question, Steve. And um, of course, the biggest controversy about meta-analysis meta -analysis is which studies do you include? And many of you saw it. It was a recent meta-analysis that included that some, um, I forget what it was a vitamin supplement or herbal remedy was helpful when all the meta-analyses showed, but previously it was not. But this newer article didn't seem to do the meta-analysis very well. Maybe, maybe was more selective in the studies that were included plus some faulty statistical analysis. Uh, but I think a meta-analysis is what you do when uh, you don't share data properly. So a meta-analysis is an excuse for not having the data that you really need to analyze the treatment effects. So we really don't have rules. NIH is starting to require certain data sharing to be in place when grants are given. Uh, we need more of that because when meta-analyses are based on published crude statistics, and these crude statistics are comparing two treatment groups not adjusting for patient heterogeneity at all. If you had the raw data, you would have a much better estimate and you'd also be able to tell which patients are benefited more than others. So the, the real uh, problem I see with meta-analysis is that uh, what's in published papers is so scant and the Cochrane collaboration and other groups doing meta-analysis are so forgiving of that, uh, they don't really recognize that if you're doing a meta-analysis of 12 studies, if you had picked the one best study and had the complete raw data for that study, that might be far superior to the meta-analysis on the 12 studies. 
Well, that's, that's a very long, I'm not actually as familiar with in terms of the prognostic use of it, but it, I've seen some studies where it's been fairly powerful. So I think you could argue that uh, about that variable, but many others. And the single variable that I see that's most missing in clinical research is the extent of the disease being treated. We tend to, tend to call people disease, not disease. There's, there's a whole spectrum of disease, and we don't measure severity of disease very well, except in the intensive care unit, which Gordon can talk to. But we, we have great severity of disease measures for organ failure. But in many other areas, we don't have true great severity of disease measures. Those are the ones I would concentrate on a little bit more. Okay, thanks.